friends welcome to another video tutorial from Shomu's Biology and in this video tutorial I'm going to talk about thin layer chromatography also known as TLC okay so let's start now we've talked about many different types of chromatography techniques but TLC is one of the very basic type of chromatography and actually little bit advanced version of paper chromatography and even in the baseline of other chromatography which are quantitative like gas chromatography or liquid chromatography. Thin layer chromatography uh, works in a very similar fashion with that of the paper chromatography. Now to understand thin layer chromatography you need to understand the basic mechanism of the paper chromatography. So what is paper chromatography? Chromatography are techniques which help us to separate mixture of different substances based on their mobility because in any type of chromatography we have two things in common it contains a stationary phase it also contains a mobile phase now stationary phase which is fixed and mobile phase is moving so mobile phase carrying our substance will start migrating all the mixture of substances throughout the stationary phase or diffusing the stationary phase right so due to the differential migration rate of all those substances or molecules few of them migrate further few of them migrate less that's how we separate different substances from a mixture that's the idea of a paper chromatography okay so the same idea apply here in case of tlc or thin layer chromatography so let me write down two things we have stationary phase and we have mobile phase. So in case of this TLC or thin layer chromatography, we also choose stationary phase and mobile phase depending upon the type of substance that we want to separate from each other. Okay. Now the major difference in terms of TLC with paper chromatography is TLC is also paper chromatography, but this is a little bit modified. Like because in paper chromatography, the matrix on which the chromatography takes place is only a paper. That's it. But in case of TLC, it carries a stationary region, a stationary phase, which is mostly made up with either plastic or silica or any other uh, inert material. On the other hand, that part, whether it's a plastic or silica, is, is like a coat on top of an aluminium foil. That's the difference between the plate that we use for TLC and the plate that we use for paper chromatography. Okay, so it's an aluminium foil on top of which silica is applied as a coat. That's what we have. That is acting as a stationary phase. That silica is acting as a stationary phase for most of the thin layer chromatography experiments. On the other hand, the mobile phase is most of the time non-polar. Because your silica is a polar material. So generally we choose non-polar mobile phase if we have a stationary phase which is polar. And if you have a non-polar stationary phase then use a polar mobile phase. Okay. But most of the time the stationary phase used here is a polar one and the mobile phase used here is a non-polar one. That's what we use in case of uh, this thin layer chromatography. Now why it is called thin layer? Because normally the silica is coated over the aluminium foil. But the coat is very very thin. It's not thick. The reason behind uh, this idea of making a very thin layer is that this thin layer will help to resolve all the mixture of molecules from each other farther and faster compared to the thick layer. Because if the layer is thick, in that case, the mobile phase will be trapped and absorbed by the stationary phase more often. But if the layer is very thin, then the mobile phase will not interact with the stationary phase. It will not get absorbed by the stationary phase much. That is the idea behind making the plate thin. That's why you have thin layer chromatography. Now the question is why we use thin layer chromatography? Now in any other chromatographic techniques that we use, we generally use them to separate different molecules from each other. Same thing applies here in thin layer chromatography. Mostly we do thin layer chromatography to test the presence of any toxic substance in our food. For like any pesticides or insecticides in the food. 
that we can easily find out. Or let's say we extract a plant uh, material or so plant extract and from that plant extract we want to separate the different components of the plant extract. Let's say from, from a medicinal plant we want to separate all the components of the plant extract that we can use, use easily with thin layer chromatography. Okay. Now the question is how thin layer chromatography is performed and what is the exact mechanism behind the thin layer chromatography. So before talking about the mechanism I must tell you how it's performed. What we have here in thin layer chromatography is simply we have a glass vessel, a big glass vessel. And in that big glass vessel what we put, we put the mobile phase. This is the mobile phase, the liquid mobile phase. Let's say this is non-polar mobile phase. We put it there. Okay. And then we have that TLC plate. So what we do generally, we take the TLC plate and it, it is like a slice of the plate. The plate is normally big. You can take a slice of it generally. You simply take the height depending upon the, uh, the, the, the substance that we use, the mixture that we use to separate. Generally, the plate can be, uh, let's say, uh, 5, 10 centimeters long. You can take it. So if you take this uh, plate and you simply take a mark with pencil in that plate, approximately 1.5 centimeter distance. Now this is the mark, it's like a running start point. It's like everywhere we start running, we have a start point and an end point. Similarly, this is the start point and let's say you, you mark certain amount uh, to be an end point. Okay, Let's say one centimeter uh, above or, 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 or above the end of the plate. So the start point is somewhere you put a specific point where you apply the mixture of solution that you want to separate from each other. Okay, so this is the sample application spot which we'll apply by putting some sample there. And you want this sample to, to run from the start point to the end point. That's what your idea is. Now how exactly your sample will run from a start point to the end point? By putting this plate into the mobile phase because stationary phase is fixed it will not separate the sample that you put there the only thing that can separate your sample is the mobile phase right because all the solvent that is used in the mobile phase will drag your sample your specimen to the end point towards the end point that's the idea now you put this plate here so let's say uh, this is this is the end point this is the start point and let's say we apply the specimen here and we put it there, okay? But actually, we, 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 we put it a little above uh, the, the, solute, the solvent there because, you know, uh, we should not submerge it into the solvent directly. Uh, we, we, we allow the solvent to, to be a little less in length from the start point. And actually, when we apply the sample, first we make this TLC plate completely dry with heat so that no further diffusion takes place there. So the sample is properly fixed into the stationary phase. Now we put the plate into the mobile phase and then we close the lid of the glass vessel. Okay, we close the lid. So now it's time to allow the mobile phase taking all the substances towards the finish line. How will they do that? With the help of capillary action. We know with the help of the capillary action, the solvent here try to move all the substances, the mixture of substances from the start point to the end point. And actually the end point is little less than the end of the actual plate because you will not allow them to completely run out of the plate, right? So you need to make sure that you stop the process once it reaches a specific deadline. That's where you apply the finish line here. So then we allow them to diffuse. And that's what happens slowly all these molecules start migrating towards the finish line. The mobile phase is migrating towards the finish line. Now the question is what is the exact mechanism of taking this mixture towards the finish line? It is depending on the differential rate of ascent through the stationary phase by the solvent. That means the mixture of specimen that is present here and the solvent. Those two things compete for each other for the migration through the stationary phase. That's what happens. Now, try to imagine one thing. Let's say this 
molecules, the, the specimen that you provide here, the sample. If the sample's nature is very similar with that of the stationary phase, then what will happen? Then the mobile phase will move faster. Because this sample, if, if the, the quality of your sample is interacting with the stationary phase more, it will move slowly. And if the sample is not interacting with the stationary phase, then it will move faster with the help of the solvent. That is the idea. That is the reason that few of those specimens will move faster and further few will move lesser. And that's how we end up in different spots in this TLC plate. So you get spots like here, let's see, different spots you can achieve. Like spot means you know once the process is run you may not see any spot. Like it, it, it can it, it may not be visible at the very beginning. So you need to make sure that you can visualize the spot later. So three things matters here during the separation. One is the nature of the solvent, the nature of the stationary phase and the sample that is used. The nature of the solvent and nature of the stationary phase should never be the same because if those things are the same then it will not allow the separation at all. That's why if we use the polar stationary phase, you should not use a polar mobile phase. You should always use a non-polar mobile phase. That's what we do here. Okay? But you never know about the sample that you take. It can be polar or non-polar. Now depending upon what kind of uh, material it is, depending upon which it will be separated. That's all. So now what we do, once the process is done, it reaches a specific deadline, what we can measure actually, we can, we can actually see uh, the plate uh, to be lightly absorbed with the solvent or not. And you can visualize that uh, some part, it already reached the, the finish line because there is no color. So this is a very uh, important step to, to, uh, to look at it every single time while the experiment is going on. That yes, you need to stop the process while it reaches the deadline, then you take it out and you dry it. So after the drying is done, then what you do, you want to develop the film. It's also like a film because you need to make sure where exactly you get the spots because that's going to tell you the separation of the specimen. Now how can you develop spots? Because you cannot visualize them always like a color. So the answer to that is present even before you started the experiment. So what you did normally, the silica that is coated over the aluminum foil is it generally contains zinc sulfide. It contains zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide is like a phosphor. And the nature of a phosphor is whenever you apply UV light, then what will you see? You will see dark spots. Why? Because a complete TLC plate contains the phosphor, which will give you a color in presence of UV light. But wherever there is a presence of the chemical factor, those regions of the TLC plate will fail to give you the color, the light. So whenever you put that TLC plate in UV after the process is done, you will see dark spots. That means those are the region where the phosphor is not present because the, the, the specimen is already occupying those regions. That's why there is no phosphor present there. That's why there is a dark spot. So whenever you're looking at under UV, you will see dark spots. And those dark spots are the regions where your specimen is actually present. So by looking at this TLC plate, you can easily tell that yes, this and this are the two separate mix, uh, specimen that is present in your mixture. That's how you can separate them out. Now the question is, this process is going to tell you about what are the constituent of a mixture. Now the question is, so is it qualitative or quantitative? The answer is, it is quantitative. You can quantify the presence and the concentration of each of the specimen. How? For a quantitative assay, you need to calculate something, right? So what is the calculation here? The calculation here is made by a simple idea that the total di the distance tra travel by each of the spot divided by so distance traveled by each spot
spot divided by the total distance traveled by the solvent and this is known as RF value or retention factor. So RF value is going to give you an idea about the migration rate and separation, differential migration rate of those substances that are present in the mixture in presence of a specific mobile phase. Because if you change the mobile phase, the RF value may change. If you change the stationary phase, the RF value may change. But for a specific stationary phase and a mobile phase, the RF value for different sample and specimens will be different. That's going to help you to understand what kind of specimen you're dealing with. So with this idea, you can also separate even small tiny differences between different molecules. That's the beauty of it. It's quite easy to calculate because you simply take this and once you see the spots, you mark them. You mark them with pencil, right? Because you know the color may fade, you may not see it in the future. So you mark them, then you take this plate out and then you measure the length with simple ruler scale. Simply measure it in centimeters and the total solvent length you also measure in centimeter. You divide them to get the RF value. Now, how we exactly quantify? To quantify uh, the presence of specimen, you need to run this same experiment with known concentration of a sample, of the same sample, to find a standard curve. So once you make a standard curve with known concentration of specimen, then you run the unknown concentration of specimen, you can easily uh, take, uh, or you can easily identify and, and uh, quantify the amount of uh, so specimen that is present that that's it that's what you can do okay another way that we can find out the presence of uh, the separated uh, components of a specimen is by different chemical processes because you know this is the process where you use a phosphor in some other processes are there we don't use phosphor but any chemical things like sulfuric acid uh, can be taken as a phosphor in most of the cases well, there is a presence of a specimen that will be turned darker because other rest of the silica they won't turn dark but wherever your specimen is present those regions will turn darker so you'll get a dark spot present uh, when we expose the TLC plate in presence of that acid so that's how you will get different spots out there and from the spot again you can measure the total length now the question is those spots are like circles so when you are measuring the distance, how can you exactly measure? Because it's a circle. Which part you should take? The top, bottom or the center? Now the answer to that, if you get a circle, you also want to get a center of that circle. And whenever you are measuring the distance, you always measure the distance from the start line to the center of that circle. That's how you should measure. So that's how we get the plate of TLC. From the TLC plate, we can quantify the presence uh, of different specimen in their concentrations. So that's how we go for TLC. It's a very basic technique but very important technique uh, for the separation of uh, many real life examples that I told you like uh, separation and, and finding toxic substances present in our food and water supply, things like that. So if you like this video, please hit the like button, share this video with your friends and subscribe to my channel to get more and more videos like this.